All right, that's us. Whoa. 402, this is ESPN 1530. My name's Mo Egger. So glad you're here. Uh, we'll jump back to David Bell getting his contract extension. You'll hear from Joe Burrow in about 15 minutes as well. We'll head to Pittsburgh in the 5 o'clock hour as we get set for the Bengals and Steelers on Sunday. Solomon Wilcox is with us, the former Bengal, part of the uh, Believe in Bengals podcast that he does with uh, Adam Pacman Jones. You can get that on the Believe uh, on the Believe uh, podcast network. And Solomon also obviously uh, does a lot of work, Sirius XM. He is also a spokes- spokesperson for Addy Text, which is, this is interesting, and I think it's timely given sort of what we're all dealing with here, but uh, the, the topic of vaccine mandates for COVID-19 in the National Football League, and uh, we could pivot to a discussion about that with our guy, Solly, who's uh, with us now. It's good to have you, sir. How are you? Doing great, Mo, and uh, good to be on with you today. Uh, talk to me first about Aditex. Tell me what this does. Uh, g- give folks an idea here uh, it, for people who are maybe still wondering, should I get the vaccine or if I get the vaccine, how much am I going to actually be protected? What does Aditex do? Well, uh, what Aditex really does is they help you to score your immunity. And this is just really smart science. Uh, you know, right now, NFL players and staff, You know, they're just like the rest of the United States population. They're faced with this binary choice mode, trying to decide between vaccination or non-vaccination. Well, the people at Adertex, they believe that knowing your immunity score, it offers a different option to help you to protect yourself against COVID-19. To tell my story very quickly, you know, back in March, I received the J&J vaccination. For nearly two months, you know, I'm walking around thinking that I'm protected from the COVID-19 virus. Well, the people at Adatex, they would score my immunity. All they did was simply, um, they would take a small amount of blood from my fingertip and I would submit it to them. And they had developed, um, you know, this process where they can measure your neutralizing antibodies. And they discovered that I had not developed any at all. I had no protection from COVID-19. So the results show that my score was very low and that I wasn't protected at all. Then in July, I went and received uh, the Pfizer vaccine and got my first dosage. Ten days later, I submitted a sample of blood to Aditex, and they found that I had produced enough neutralizing antibodies to be protected from the COVID-19 virus. So this is really smart science. They uh, teamed up with Sphere DX right in the, here in the tri-state. You can go and get your immunity scored, whether you're in Kentucky, Ohio, or Indiana. All you have to do is go to the website at www.adatext.com. That's A-D-I-T-X-T score.com. Adatextscore.com. Quickly tell me how it works. Basically what it does is they take a, sna- a sample of your blood, and they can, they can basically test your blood for neutralizing antibodies, which is really the key. Um, we all know about the Delta variant. Um, the variant has what we call breakthrough cases, uh, where people have been vaccinated, but yet and still they uh, attract the variant for COVID-19. Now, they're not as sick as maybe as if they would if they didn't get vaccinated. And we're certainly advising that people do get vaccinated. But by knowing your score, that tells you if you have a proper immune level. Like our immunity is constantly changing. As you well know, when you get on an airplane, (laughs) or get off a, a red-eye flight, you don't get enough sleep, or if you've been hanging out with your friends, your immunity is lowered because you're tired, right? Or you, maybe you haven't eaten right or had the proper nutrition. By using this science that Adatex is offering to score your immunity, you, you can know if your immune levels are at a significant level um, to fight COVID-19. And so that's really the um, science behind it all. I think it offers a very interesting and wonderful option for those people who might even already have some pre-existing condition and wondering if they should take the vaccine. More importantly, we should know if we have a healthy, robust immune system. You can know your score. You can find an Aditex score partner near you, and this is pretty much good for all across the tri-state, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Aditexscore.com. That's A-D-I-T-X-T score. Dot com. Uh, make sure you uh, you check that out. Solomon Wilcox is with us. Uh, a week ago at this time, I felt pretty good about where the Bengals were going. 
I love the aggressive play calling. I love the way Joe Burrow played. And then I saw what happened in Chicago where they didn't throw a pass downfield for the first half of the game. They were very, they're very uh, not only anemic, but just non-productive and boring offensively. Where, where was the explosiveness we talked about last week, Solly? I was really disappointed. You know, we can only manage uh, the longest play was 14 yards during the first half. It was all dink and dunk. And then defenses started sitting on everything, right? And I was really concerned even last week. I, I talked to you about this. I thought Minnesota hit Joe Burrow way too much in the, in the week one contest. They had five sacks on Burrow in that game. The Bears had another four sacks. And so here we are again going down this road where the quarterback's getting hit too much. And if he doesn't get hit, you and I both know – we should be getting one-on-one matchups on the outside with T. Higgins and, you know, with Jamar Chase and Tyler Boyd. As long as we continue to feed the ball to Joe Mixon inside, we should be getting one-on-one opportunities outside in the passing game. I-, I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to go with the quick passing game to get the ball out quick so he doesn't get hit. But now it's, all it's doing is turning it into this dink and dunk small ball offense that nobody wants to see. Right, and the, the whole idea behind drafting Jamar Chase was explosiveness, fireworks. We can beat teams downfield, and you did that, and you eschewed the opportunity to take an offensive lineman with the fifth pick. I think for a lot of folks, if you would have said, well, this is how the offense is going to look, they would have said, well, forget taking the wide receiver. If you're not going to have him run the routes that you drafted him to run, as good as Jamar Chase has been, go ahead and take the offensive lineman. Oh, uh, man, look, I, you know, I said it from the beginning. Uh, touchdowns follow blocking, not the other way around. You protect, you protect uh, the quarterback, you're going to create some big plays. But here we are. I don't think anyone is going to ever regret the Bengals taking Jamar Chase. He did. He showed up again. Mm-hmm. You know, he gets, one, he gets one-on-one on the outside. He's going to create big plays. We just got to protect with the linemen that we do have, right? And with the linemen we do have, we got to be able to run block for Joe Mixon to get him to the second level of the offense. This offense works better when it goes through the offensive line and it's run-blocking prowess and when we're feeding the ball to Joe Mixon. If if you don't do that, you're not going to get enough deep shots. And here's the deal. T. Higgins got to hold on to the ball. And then Joe Burrow can't, can't, can't throw the three interceptions in a row. Those four turnovers were the undoing of the Bengals, who, oh, by the way, still had a chance to win it if all we could do is tackle Justin Fields. <laughs> yeah. so we, let the, we let those guys uh, break too many tackles to get first down at critical moments of the game. I do think beyond that play and Logan Wilson not, not falling on the fumble earlier, that, that you had to walk away from that performance against the Bears pretty happy with what they did defensively. I think you had to walk away from the Minnesota game for the most part pretty happy with what they did defensively, especially up front. I think the way they played – over the first two weeks on that side of the ball does portend them having a chance on Sunday in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I think Lou Anaromo's done a really good job with the defense, providing Trey Wayans hadn't played for us. You know, that, you know, when you think about signing a cornerback in free agency, that defense coordinator wants that player at his disposal, but he hasn't had, had him. He's had to use backup corners. And I think right now we're, you know, we're kind of getting by now. Um, I think the Bengals forced Justin Fields to play poorly. I think we were on our way to forcing Andy Dalton to play poorly. They did get him out the game. I love what DJ Reader's bringing. I love what Larry Ogunjobi is bringing. I think the defensive front is doing a really good job. Um, And now this is going to be a big week, as you well know, against Pittsburgh. I I think the Bengals, they ought to smell blood in the water like they, they did on the Monday night game when they last played Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. They got to go in there and make the Steelers a loser. I thought they were the better team on Sunday against the Bears, and the Bengals didn't win. I think they can prove themselves to be the better team on Sunday. This would be a huge win for them. Solomon Wilcox, one half of the Believe in Bengals podcast on the Believe Podcast Network, does that alongside Adam Jones. Here you saw, hear him on uh, Sirius XM, and again, a spokesperson for Atatex. Get your score and uh, expand your immune monitoring, expand your immunity, expand what you know about how the vaccine may help you. AtatexScore.com. It's always good to talk to you, man. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mo. All the best to you. You you got it. That's our our guy, Solomon Wilcox, the absolute best, 12 minutes after uh, 4 o'clock. You'll hear from Joe Burrow coming up in uh, just about eight minutes. More on David Bell here in uh, just a second as well. I mentioned before that 
BetOnline.ag has Joe Burrow, I'm sorry, has Zach Taylor as the odds-on favorite to be the first coach let go in 2021. I don't know that that I believe he's going to be let go this year. I, I do think the, the conversation can exist based on the way things unfold, but I think they have more than a puncher's chance to win the game on Sunday. I do think they'll beat the Jacksonville Jaguars. I do think they will beat the uh, Detroit Lions. That Green Bay game asked me before it, but I, I don't I don't think this is going to be a thing. If they lose a bunch of games, it will be a thing. That said, Sunday was extraordinarily sobering. And I, I know you could take the approach of, look, it's early, it's one game, things are going to be okay, don't worry about it. But this is a season that in many respects is more about who the head coach is and who it's going to be more than anything else, right? We talked about it for months. This season, you got to find out, is Zach Taylor the guy? When, when your personnel is hopefully in a position to win a championship, and they're far away from that, um, do they have the right coach? What edge does this head coach give them? What you saw on Sunday did not lend itself to positive answers to those questions. What we saw on Sunday was the antithesis of what this offense is supposed to be and what NFL offenses are supposed to be. I understand that this team's offensive line is not where it needs to be. I understand what the Chicago Bears were doing schematically to keep the Bengals essentially, you know, left to play inside a phone booth. But their, 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 their plan this offseason to do what they did in the draft and to do what they did in, in free agency and to do what they didn't do in the draft and free agency was based on, I think, this sort of um, implication, if you will, that Zach Taylor is still going to be able to figure out how to orchestrate this offense in a way that's going to be productive enough to win football games. Nobody thought the Bengals were going to have a great offensive line this year. We thought they would hopefully have a, an improved offensive line. But we still thought that pass, block, uh, pass blocking might be um, a, a little bit of a problem. But it was going to be okay. Giving Joe Burrow and Zach Taylor weapons to work with. You add to Sunday's frustration the lack of track record. I saw the stat today on Twitter. Um, Zach Taylor's offense has scored two or fewer touchdowns in 24 out of 34 games. Uh, they scored one touchdown or less in 14 out of 34 games. Only two teams in the NFL over those 34 games have a lower points per game average. The Jacksonville Jaguars and the New York Jets. I saw this at Wolf Cal Son. If I'm mispronouncing that, my apologies. There's no track record to point to that would say this guy offensively can bring out the most in the weapons that he has and then armed with weapons. And I just, the narrative for months was, look, the offensive line's going to be better, but oh, look, look at the wealth of weapons. Now, Joe Burrow has to play better, and it's okay to say that. Joe Burrow can't throw the picks that he threw two of which I think were squarely on him. But that wasn't a problem in the first half on Sunday. The first half it was, we're just going to let the Bears dictate what we do. We're going to play very vanilla, very boring, very non-explosive offense. We're going to dink and dunk. We're going to do everything we can to protect Joe Burrow, except keep a running back in the backfield. The results were terrible. The results were terrible. We're trying to find out this year if Zach Taylor can provide an advantage. Well, on Sunday against the Chicago Bears, he failed to provide a schematic advantage. Maybe he provided a motivational advantage. Maybe he provided a cultural advantage. He didn't provide much of a tactical advantage. In fact, I would say he was at a tactical disadvantage. That is the conversation from Sunday. More so than at any point in week in uh, in, uh, in year one or year two of the Zach Taylor era, this is the year we're trying. Is this the guy? Well, if he's the guy, it's based on what offensively, to a degree, he helps provide an advantage. Especially now that he's armed with all these weapons. Where was it on Sunday? And unfortunately, because of of Zach's 
relative inexperience as a head coach and an NFL play caller, you can't point to his track record that gives you some degree of comfort. Can't. So, yeah, he should absolutely be in your crosshairs. He's in my crosshairs. This is how it works in the year, which is all about Zach Taylor having to win football games. By the way, I mean, that game on Sunday against Chicago could be the difference between a six-win season and a seven-win season or a seven-win season and an eight-win season, right? And then you're going to go, wait, wait a minute, what, what, what kept them from having the kind of year that we really thought they could have from a win-loss perspective? Well, here's a game that you look at their performance, their defense was fine against Chicago. And again, not pinning it all on Zach Taylor, but guess what, man? Joe Burrow is going to be the starting quarterback. This is a season in which Zach Taylor has to start answering questions. Does he provide an advantage to the Cincinnati Bengals? On Sunday, was the answer yes? Given that the answer is no, I will then ask, well, when is the answer going to be yes? Because on Sunday against the Bears, he lost. He, he, he gave away an opportunity to prove that the answer is yes. 18 minutes after 4 o'clock. Uh, Reds rained out today, but they've made news. David Bell's coming back. David Bell is coming back to manage the Reds in uh, 2022. Um We'll have some audio of David Bell and Nick Crawl talking about this. But then there's who you're not going to hear from coming up on ESPN 1530 Cincinnati Sports Station.